Isaac Love, the WNBA Haxton, is best known for being the runner-up in the 2007 Poker Stars Caribbean Adventure, a finish that netted him $862,000. It would be hard for most people not to hit the tournament trail after that kind of finish, and Haxton took to the trail with gusto. His tournament winnings now exceed $1 million, bolstered mainly by his success in the 2007 World Series of Poker, in which he had three caches, including one final table and a top 100 finish in the main event. Haxton has also been flexing his poker muscles online, playing in the high-stakes, six-max, no-limit hold'em cash games. And he recently joined the team of poker professional trainers that contribute training videos and strategy articles for Card Player Pro and Poker Savvy Plus. Card Player Pro is the new offering from the partnership between Card Player and Poker Savvy Plus that gives card player readers and viewers access to valuable poker insight with hand-for-hand -hand strategy lessons. The addition of Haxton to the Card Player Pro team will strengthen in an already incredible roster of talent. We have Isaac on the phone with us right now to talk strategy and possibly give us a sneak peek to what we can expect from his upcoming videos and strategy articles for Card Player Pro. Okay, so how are you doing today, Isaac? I'm doing pretty well. Good to hear. Well, I really appreciate you doing this interview with us. Thanks, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> well, the first question I have is, and this is kind of old news, but I've got to ask, how did it feel to have $800,000 stuck in NetTeller when they pulled out of the U.S. after your second place finish in the PCA? Well, I sort of went through several different phases of emotion <laughs> about that. I mean, when it first happened, I thought it, my first reaction was, it's probably not going to be a big deal. I'll probably get back in a couple of weeks. Uh, but then a couple of weeks went by and the situation didn't seem to be getting better. <laughs> and I started getting pretty worried, obviously. Uh, I started talking to some lawyers about it who were completely unhelpful. Uh, <laughs> As usual. And basically were just trying to get me to pay them a big retainer without telling me what they were going to do. Um, and... I started getting pretty scared after uh, maybe a month or two with the money still locked up and no sign that I was going to be getting it back. <laughs> uh, but as time went by, I talked to some people who knew people closer to the situation who assured me that I was going to get my money back. And after a few months, I was pretty confident that was true that I was going to get it back sometime in 2007. Uh, but even and, but even two months with $800,000 on the line is probably too much. Yeah, it was pretty stressful. Well, so that finish was your first major score in poker, but you've followed up with a series of very decent finishes in live tournaments to bump your lifetime winnings to more than $1 million. Were you already a good poker player before the PCA win, or did you still need to learn a lot uh, about poker after that finish? Well, I've definitely learned a lot since then. I'm a much better player now than I was a year ago. Uh, but I'd already been playing pretty seriously for about three years by the time of the PCA. At that point, I was probably a better limit than no limit player. I'd uh, been playing limit for almost all of my poker career up to that point. I'd switched to no limit less than six months before the PCA. Okay. Uh, so I was already a pretty good poker player. I was just an above-average, no-limit player at that point. Okay. I've gotten a lot better since. Well, how did you improve your no-limit game after that win? Mainly just by playing a lot. Um, I played a lot of no-limit cash online and played a lot of live tournaments and got better at both the number-crunching technical sides of the game from um, playing so much online, and also I'm much, much more comfortable playing in live tournaments now than I was a year ago. Well, you say you're more comfortable, but what was making you uncomfortable, and how did you deal with that? I felt that my physical reads on other players were not as good as they could be, and that's definitely still one of the weakest points in my game. Uh, just picking up physical reads on other players. And also, since I had never really played live before, I had no reason to be that confident I wasn't giving off tons of tells myself. Gotcha. And, in fact, uh, a tell I gave off 
heads up against Ryan and ended up making a huge difference at the final table. And what was that? Uh, um, apparently some people had picked up on this tendency I had then, which I've now corrected to, um, stare my opponents down when I wanted action and look away when I didn't, which is a reversal of right. a very common tell that a lot of people have of staring people down to intimidate them when they don't want action and looking away to try to make them more comfortable when they do. Right. Uh, and there was a hand... Uh, when Ryan and I were heads up, where he opened on the button, I re-raised the 7-3 suited and was looking right at him, or, no, was um, looking away, and he shoved over me with Queen-9. Okay. So you say that you mainly improved your game using experience as your teacher. Have have you ever read any poker books or, like, watched any poker training videos that have helped you? Oh, absolutely. Um, earlier on in my poker career, when I was just getting started, I read basically every book I could get my hands on and found that very useful. And um, I've spent a lot of time posting on online forums about poker, discussing hands, and, uh, yeah, coaching videos can be very helpful, too. I had a card runner subscription um, when they first opened and watched some of their videos. That definitely helped me making the transition to No Limit. Okay. Well, speaking of the training poker videos, you recently joined up with Poker Savvy Plus, which means that you'll be contributing training videos and strategy articles for Card Player Pro, which is kind of a poker training package available on cardplayer.com. So what kinds of things are you going to be showing people in your videos? Well, the great thing about watching poker videos is that you get to listen to a good player talk about what's going through their head as they're making decisions. Um, and that's really helpful when you're trying to learn the game to be able to see exactly what someone is considering when they're making their decisions while they play. And I think I'm a particularly good instructor because I'm good at vocalizing exactly what things I'm considering when I make my decisions. I'm a pretty analytical player. I know exactly why I'm doing the things I'm doing, as opposed to a lot of the other very good players I know who are more intuitive. Okay. Well, what specialty do you have that you're going to be teaching people about in your videos? As far as, like, what kind of poker do you play? Cash games, tournaments? I play mainly cash games when I'm, you know, playing on my own time to make money. But I'll be playing both cash games and uh, tournaments in the videos. I consider myself a pretty good tournament player. I'd play more of them if there were bigger stakes tournaments online. Okay. But I really only play tournaments for uh, the big live events on my own time. But I will be doing... Um, instructional tournament videos, and I'll be doing both six max and nine-handed cash game videos. Okay, great. Well, ideally, how are people supposed to turn around and use the information that they get from these training videos? Well, one very good thing they can do is anything that I do or say that surprises them in the video, they can go on the Poker Savvy forums and post questions that I can then answer for them. So, it's hard for me to predict exactly what in the course of a video is going to be surprising to people, so I don't get to necessarily cover everything in as much depth as would be ideal. So anything they see that they would have done differently, they can post about it and engage me in a discussion about why I'm making the decisions I am. Okay. And actually, that's a good point, too, because like you hear a lot, uh, poker isn't a game of absolutes. So when people post their own theories in this forum, it can at least be discussed and you can see different points of views on the exact same play. So, Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely a very good benefit to the site. What do you do against an opponent who is wildly aggressive and constantly raising you off of hands in a cash game? Is the only real option to bide your time and hope that you get his money before someone else does? Well, it depends on the situation, of course. As you were just saying, poker is not a small game of absolutes. 
But, yeah, I mean, if somebody is just going to put their stack in every hand, you have to wait until you have a better hand than them to call it off. And that doesn't mean you have to wait until you can beat top pair even necessarily, but you certainly adjust your hand valuation against somebody who's playing that aggressively. And one thing you can do is to tighten up your pre-flop and flop play so that you more often have a big hand when you get to the turn and river so that you're not getting blown off in big pots with mediocre hands. Okay. That, that's something that a lot of people do wrong against over-aggressive players, I think, is that they'll want to play as many hands against them as they can because they think they're playing poorly and they want to get their money as soon as possible. But if somebody is playing overly aggressive, you're sort of playing into their strategy by putting yourself in lots of spots where you have to make tough decisions with third pair against them. Absolutely. Well, and what also factors into that is how the table itself is responding to this wild player because it changes the entire dynamic of the player of the other players. How do you really take that into account? Because you aren't just playing against this one wild player and waiting till you have a big hand against them. A lot of times you may be playing against this wild player plus someone else whose play could also be changed drastically because of the wild play. Yeah, that's a good point, too. Um, that's a spot where you can exploit what I was just talking about before, where other players will tend to loosen up to try to play more pots against the weak and over-aggressive player. And then, so if the maniac, say, opens one or two seats off the button and gets re-raised by... Uh, an observant, aggressive player who likes to play a lot of hands against a maniac, then you can four bet really loose from the blinds and just try and steal the pot because the other two players are putting so much money in pre flop with mediocre hands that you can just start four bet shoving mediocre aces over them and there's nothing they can really do about it. Good call. Well, so what kind of environment do you usually play online cash games in? I mean, is there music playing? Is the TV on? Or is your instant messenger on? Like, what do you, what's your ideal environment? I guess my ideal environment is uh, music on, instant messenger off, um, just sitting at my desk by myself. Is there anything else going on in the room, or do you, do you have, like, any other distractions that you need to consciously make sure don't come into play? Um, I mean, I have two roommates, or I live with three other people, two roommates who are both poker players and my girlfriend, so all of them know not to really bother me <laughs> too much while I'm playing. Um, I'd say, I mean, I don't answer my phone while I'm playing, okay. but... I don't have a hard time tuning out distractions, but if I let myself do other things while I was playing, I should definitely see that being problematic. How many tables do you play at once? Uh, it varies a lot depending on what I'm playing. Uh, if I'm playing all at least six-handed games, I can easily play eight, sometimes ten. Um, but I've also been playing a good bit of heads-up recently, which requires a lot more concentration. So often I'll play something like two heads-up games and four six-max games or three and three or something like that. Okay. Well, you've been a pretty... You've played a lot of volumes since you've won that... Since you got second place in that tournament recently. Yeah. So what's the hardest thing about playing poker professionally now that you've been doing it for about a year? Well, I was really playing pretty close to professionally for two years before the PCA score. Okay. Um, I guess the toughest thing is riding out really bad losing streaks. I went about seven months of a little worse than break even uh, the year before my PCA score, uh, just before I switched from limit to no limit. And... It can be really hard to make yourself play every day when you just can't win. <laughs> well, so how'd you deal with it? Um, By winning? <laughs> <laughs> it, 
eventually. Uh, <laughs> I eventually switched to no limit, actually. It was toward the end of that losing streak that I switched from limit to no limit. And I guess during a losing streak like that, uh, switching up the games you're playing, learning a new game can be a good way to keep poker fun and interesting. Okay. Well, what's the life of a poker player really like? I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of viewers out there with some gross misconceptions about the lifestyle and the commitments involved. Well, I guess one pretty common misconception would be that a professional poker player plays all of the big live tournaments and just hangs out the rest of the year. (laughs) And there's pretty much nobody other than, like, Phil Helmuth, who does that. <laughs> um, the, li- the big live tournaments are great, but you really can't make a living consistently year to year just playing the live 10Ks. It's so easy to go 50 tournaments without a big win that you can't rely on that alone. So everybody spends a lot of time either playing live cash games or playing online cash games or playing lots of smaller tournaments or something. Um, there's a lot more there's a, day-to-day a, grinding than most people probably realize. Okay. And what kind of time commitment every day does it take and like how many days a week do you find yourself committing to it? That varies a lot for different people, I'm sure. Uh, I'm also still finishing up school right now. This is my last semester at Brown. Um, So I play almost every day, but usually not more than a couple hours. I'd say I probably play between 20 and 30 hours a week when I'm in school. Uh, Probably more like between 30 and 40 when I'm have not been in school and have been really playing full-time. But one thing people tend not to think about is that as a professional poker player, you spend a lot more time doing your job than you do just playing. There's a lot more to being a professional poker player than the hours you spend at the table. I spend a lot of time going over hands I've played on my own, reviewing them, making sure I'm happy with all the decisions I've made in big pots and discussing hands with my friends and people I know online. And I think it's really important to do that, to spend, you know, at least a quarter as much time as you spend playing, just thinking about poker and working on your game. Okay. Well, what puts you on tilt in poker? I guess I'm pretty lucky in that I have just sort of always had the personality to not get very upset by that sort of thing. I tend to be pretty even keeled when I'm playing. I guess uh, things that tend to piss me off the most are when I'm playing heads up and lose a couple of big pots and then my opponent quits me. That's always frustrating. <laughs> Well, how do you overcome something like that? Uh, Do you have to stop playing, or...? Usually not. Uh, It is important, though, to recognize when you are too tired or tilted, upset, whatever, to be playing and to quit. Uh, I know a lot of players who would be doing much better in poker if they only played when they were playing their A game. That's a definite weakness of a lot of otherwise very strong players. Absolutely. How often do you pass on tournaments in your schedule just because you're not in the mood or because you're not feeling 100% to play in them? And I'm talking big tournaments like the the 10Ks, stuff like that. Since I uh, went back to school this past fall to finish up, I have played very few live tournaments. But that's been... I guess that's not really passing on things that were in my schedule. I wasn't really planning on going to any of them in the first place. Well, in fact, that Uh, kind of 
it strengthens my point. You, if you have so few that you're going to be playing in and you're kind of looking forward to playing in one, but then the day comes up that you're supposed to play in it and you aren't quite feeling it or you aren't feeling 100%, are you willing to, to just drop it? Or, or honestly, do you, do you think you'd still go play? I'd probably still go play. <laughs> um, if, if I had traveled to a tournament, mm-hmm. if I could get myself out of bed and downstairs to the table, I would play. <laughs> <laughs> well, how, how do you compensate for that? I mean, is it really just being cognizant of the fact that you aren't 100% and kind of working to counteract that? Yeah, I guess so. Um, I generally find that once I'm at the table, even if I've been feeling bad right beforehand, feeling sick and distracted and whatever, I can sort of get myself in the zone and really play pretty close to my best, even if I'm not feeling well. Okay. Well, what have you found to be the best way to play the early stages of these big buy-in tournaments when all of the players are so deep stacked? I think that uh, that stage of the tournament tends to really favor me because I'm primarily a cash game player right. and have a lot more experience in the deep stack situations than most tournament players do. So I tend to play the early levels of tournaments very, very aggressively. I try to play big pots constantly when I'm in position. And I, in particular, try to identify the players at my table who I think I have a strong edge on, either because they're just weak players or I feel like I have a good read on their game, and in particular try to play a lot of bots against them. Okay. Well, that actually seems contrary to what I've been hearing from a lot of people. Um, you're saying that you like playing big pots in the early levels when you're deep stacked. A lot of people say that you should kind of be more passive, not not passive, but be tighter in the beginning stages and looser when it gets down to the bubble and stuff like that. But you're saying you want to be playing these big pots during the deep stack stages. Yeah. Um, well, there are there are sort of different facets to um, playing a tight or loose game. Uh, in the early levels, you obviously can't be stacking off as like pre-flop because there are so many more chips your opponents can wait you out. But you can be seeing a lot of flops and then playing very aggressively post-flop so that the pots are getting pretty big by the river. You don't want to be playing big pots pre-flop with weak hands in the early levels. Whereas later on on the bubble, when effective stacks are often less than 20 big blinds, you can just be open shoving pretty mediocre hands from late position. And you're certainly not going to be doing anything like that at early levels, <laughs> but you can definitely play loose and aggressive in a very different sort of way, and I think it makes sense to if you're one of the strongest players at the table. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, the last question I have for you then is that there has been a fair amount of trash talking going on regarding whether or not online players or live players are better. So what do you think about that, and what are the major differences that you see between those two types of players? It's such a broad question to ask, are online players or live players better? Because a lot of people Uh, transition between the two nowadays anyway. A lot of people transition between the two, and it's not really all that clear what is meant by better. Better at what? Um, And which live players and which online players? I think that the best online cash game players are better at shorthanded and heads-up no-limit cash games than anyone who plays exclusively live. But There are very few people who play mainly online who would have a chance in the big mixed games that go live. Um, And as for tournament play, I think that the best online tournament players tend to have a stronger understanding of pre-flop math and push-fold situations than 
a lot of live pros do, but that the live players, some of them, more than make up for it in the live tournaments that they play by having a huge edge over any of the online players in um, reading physical tells from their opponents and exploiting the weaker player's life. Okay. Uh, there are just so many different things to be good or bad at in poker that it's very hard to say that one group is better at poker than another. Right. Well, let's put you on the spot then. Who is the best online poker player out there um, for tournaments? For tournaments? It's pretty hard to say. Uh... There are a lot who are very good and play very similarly. I don't know. I guess if I had to pick just on results, um, not just on results, but letting results sway me a bit, uh, Scott Freeman, uh, SC Trojans, and um, I can't remember his actual name, but uh, Wes Menlo. Uh, Isaac Barron. What? Isaac, Isaac Barron. Yeah, that's right. Um, and Isaac Barron's also an excellent cash game player. I play a lot against him in cash games. Yeah, he um, definitely is. I'd say those two have to be up there for the best online tournament players. Okay. Well, that sounds great. That's all I have for you. I really appreciate you doing this interview with us. Yeah, it was fun. And thank you guys for watching The Online Zone on Card Player TV. And be sure to check out Isaac's videos for Card Player Pro coming up very soon.